sao in ring shring ka e la ring asang ka hala ring ta ka la ring sao ain kling ring shring Namaste. So yesterday we talked about the chakras and the different states of consciousness associated with them. So today I would like to link that understanding with the chatur darshanam, the four views of reality of the world and the self. So remember yesterday we started talking about the lower three chakras as the animal. Uh, this is the part of us that's like our pet animal, you know? And the sex chakra, the energy storage chakra, and the movement chakra are the three chakras that are part of this. Now, this consciousness, this consciousness which is similar to an animal consciousness, is what we know as jagrat. Jagrat means, oh, there are so many things, <laughs> many things, huh? and they're real. And I am real, I meaning the empirical self, the ego, the self as body. Huh? So in this state of consciousness, we find almost the whole population, really 95 to 98 or 9 percent of everybody, thinks I am the body. The body is real. Huh? And see, this is the disease that the Buddha talked about, where we see the transient, the impermanent, as permanent. Because to, to be real, absolutely real, means no beginning, no end. But the body has a beginning and an end. Yet, for the sake of convenience, and for peace of mind and so on, we take the body as real, you see? And so we endow it with the quality that it doesn't really have. And because of that, we are disappointed when it fails us and we suffer. So because of this suffering, we start to search for a way out. There must be something better than this. And so this is the realm of karma yoga. Karma yoga means following the scriptural rules and regulations to um, increase the collection of pious karma, shubha karma, what we might call good karma, or karma that results in enjoyment in the future. So charity, helping others, like uh, being a caregiver, being a teacher, uh, being a parent, you know, all of these things, being a good person, basically, is what gives us good karma in the future. And specifically, doing religious rituals aimed at satisfaction of God, according to the rules and regulations of the scriptures. This is karma yoga. Now, the next chakra, of course, is the heart chakra. And the heart chakra has all kinds of desires for happiness, for peace, uh, for so many things. Huh? But really, all, they, all these desires can be boiled down to a certain taste. And we went over that briefly yesterday, the five basic tastes or rasas, neutrality, servitorship, friendship, parenthood, and conjugal love. So we want to enjoy life by tasting one of these five tastes and the subsidiary tastes that are in harmony with it. This is the way that people try to enjoy life. So this consciousness is basically dream consciousness. Uh, this is svapna, the state of consciousness when we dream. We not only dream at night when we're asleep, huh? we also dream during the day when we're awake. These states of consciousness can coexist. They're not exclusive. 
Yet, one of them is always going to be the focus or the center of gravity of the consciousness. So, in the heart, the consciousness is centered on dreams and desires, huh? the beautiful dreams of happiness and, and what we would really want as uh, our enjoyment in life. So this yoga is the bhakti yoga. And of course, bhakti means love of God. So when the yoga process through collection of punya or pious karma reaches a stage of maturity, this love of God automatically blooms in the heart. And we find a form of God, a particular mood or pastime of God that attracts us. And this doesn't have to be exactly the same as the scriptures, although for many people it is, probably the majority of people, but still, this is really something very personal. It's something very unique to each and every one of us. The, the kind of service that we would love to do for God eternally and really the service that only we can do. It's very highly individual, very unique to each person. So this taste, this is the basis of bhakti yoga. And when this taste develops up to what's called prema, which means ecstatic love, uh, one gets all kinds of ecstatic symptoms, feelings of energy moving in the body, um, pulaka, um, like goosebumps or haripalation on the skin. Like when you're cold, huh? you get goosebumps. But this is with it when you're not cold. <laughs> it's because of ecstatic love. Crying, laughing, singing, dancing, sometimes falling and rolling on the ground. I mean, it can get really intense. So when this bhakti stage matures, then the next stage is meditation. How is that? Because the mind becomes concentrated on a single object, which is the particular form of God that we love. So this automatically leads to meditation. And in meditation, we are focused on the Agnya Chakra, the forehead chakra. See? Meditation means looking through the mind and trying to clear the mind of all unnecessary thoughts, which is really all thoughts. <laughs> and so this stage of consciousness is called sushupta. Sushupta means that there are no thoughts in the mind. There is no object to consciousness. Consciousness is purely subjective. That means awareness of awareness, awareness of one's being without any object, without any duality. So this is the Vivartavada, the knowledge that the world is simply an appearance, an illusion. And so what we try to do is to remove all these unnecessary thoughts from the mind through meditation or Raja Yoga. The whole teaching of the Buddha is basically about this. So this is the stage where one tries to achieve silence and emptiness. And when this stage is mature, one realizes the crown chakra. The crown chakra is pure consciousness, pure awareness. And the material mind, the material body, the material world don't exist in that stage. Uh, and this is called Turiya. Turiya simply means the fourth, because there's no way to describe it, actually. This is where words and symbols fail. So this is the essence, the, or the quintessence, the ultimate stage of consciousness. And when, when this is attained, this is self-realization. And this is called Mukti. And one who attains it is called Mukta or Jivan Mukta, one who is liberated while still living. This is the stage that we aim for. This is the ultimate state of yoga. Yoga means joining the individual soul to the super soul, the individual limited being 
to the unlimited being of God. So this is the aim of yoga. And these are the four states of consciousness. And, and you can see from the diagram, these are the chakras associated with them. Even though the focus of consciousness is on one or another of these four stages at any particular time, that doesn't mean that the other states go away. As I mentioned before, waking and dreaming can exist at the same time. So waking, dreaming, meditation, and self-realization can all exist at the same time. Indeed, in the state of Turiya, see, Turiya is the actual origin of our consciousness, the pure awareness. So when we shift from one state of consciousness to another, like from waking to dreaming, or from dreaming to deep sleep, or the reverse, uh, coming out of sleep, we briefly pass through Turiya on the way. You know, it's like a house that has several rooms off of one main room. Uh, and to go from one room to another, you have to go through the main room or the corridor, uh, the hallway. So this is what consciousness is like. And Turiya is the main room. Turiya is the real real uh, consciousness. So you have to go through this state to get from one to the other of waking, sleeping, dreaming. So we all experience Turiya every day. Actually, we all experience it all the time. <laughs> but because we don't understand or recognize it, then we don't cognize it. We don't say, oh yeah, this is Turiya. But actually, without Turiya, none of the other states have any meaning. So Turiya is the ground state of consciousness, pure awareness, without an object except itself, because you are aware that you are aware. Ramana Maharshi used to ask people who came to him to say, please, give me, give me enlightenment, give me self-realization. He used to say, well, do you exist? <laughs> and of course, that's the start of a conversation. And it usually goes something like this. Oh, of course I exist. See, here's my body. No, that's not you. Because the body is impermanent. It's temporary. It comes and goes. That can't be you because you're eternal. You're a soul. You're a spirit. So what's more than that? And, you know, eventually the conversation comes to the point, oh, I exist because I'm aware. Well, how do you know that you're aware? You must be aware of awareness. You must be conscious of consciousness, isn't it? That's Turiya. That consciousness is Turiya. <laughs> so, when we reach that stage, <laughs> this is full of ecstatic bliss. <laughs> because one realizes one's immortality, one's unlimited nature. See, the body is limited because it's temporary. But consciousness is unlimited. It never begins or ends. Uh, sometimes it has objects, sometimes it doesn't. That's all right. You're still aware, and you're aware that you're aware. So this is the symptom of Brahman. This is the symptom of the soul. We know that we are because we are aware that we're aware. And this is the ultimate goal of yoga. Aum Tatsa. Aum Shakti Aum.